Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Said this, this was a good, obedient group. Thank you. We're starting right on time for our uh, run of show, so appreciate that. My name is Allison Lake. I'm the executive director of Westchester Children's Association. Really appreciate you all coming out this morning for the release of our 2023 data bulletin. For those of you who may not know, Westchester Children's Association is the county's only multi-issue children's advocacy organization. We work to ensure that all children are healthy, safe, and prepared for life's challenges, regardless of race or zip code. Okay. First question for you. How many of you perhaps remember this document from <laughs> 2008? <laughs> yes, we got a few hands. I took this off my bookshelf, got, dusted it off uh, yesterday. So it's been a long time, um, and to sort of toot our own horn, WCA remains the primary source of data on the status of children, youth, and young adults in our county. Looking around this morning, I have to say that sometimes plan C's are for the better. We had many ideas on how, where, and when to release the data, and the fact that we've landed in the tech room of the Carver Center seems to make perfect sense really this morning. As we share data on the challenges children and families face in Westchester and the types of resources like the Carver Center needed to support them. I want to certainly take the time to thank our data bulletin sponsors, PCSB Community Foundation and the Robin Hood Foundation for helping to power our data. And a shout out to Loris, who came from Stanford on the way to New York City from Robin Hood to be with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. We certainly cannot do our work without their financial support, so thank you. The bulletin's high-level takeaways is that children still face unequal social economic, health, and educational outcomes, and the racial and ethnic disparities remain stubbornly with us. WC advocates for solutions that break down economic barriers and create pathways to equity. I will share more on our current um, advocacy a little later. We certainly always do our work in partnership, and I want to thank elected officials and their representatives who are here with us this morning, and Willis from Majority Leader Stuart Cousins. We have uh, Rachel Estra from Senator Shelley Mayer, Vera I'm sorry, Verona. Verena um, from C. Votis's office, and we have the Vice Chair of the Board of Legislators, uh, Nancy Barr, with us this morning, and we are expecting some others who may join us in a little bit. I haven't missed anyone. Joan Grandjumont Thomas, who's our village trustee. Oh, village trustee and dear friend. <laughs> Absolutely, Joan. <laughs> thank back. you. Thank you. And Deputy Mayor. <laughs> WCA is used by nonprofits, schools, government departments, and advocates of all stripes to help clearly paint the picture of children, youth, and young adults in our county. I hear often that data was used when someone was writing a grant application. We know that our advocacy and data is used to highlight the need or challenges, as heard in just these past weeks at the county budget of legislators' uh, budget hearings or helping government to find ways to understand the challenges our residents face, like our survey on digital access that has been referenced by the county's Connect All um, Coalition and is part of the county's digital access plan to the state. Today, we will have hard copies to distribute to those of you in attendance. We will mail our copies to elected officials, school superintendents, and other key community partners to make them available and also make them available at upcoming events. We're taping this presentation for our YouTube channel and the bulletin will be available online on our website later today. I certainly want to thank Limery Cabrera, our Director of Data, Operations and Finance and the Project Lead who pushes all of us to become better statisticians. Thank you, Lim. Shout out to the WCA team, Angel, Gabby, and Karen. 
Our board president, Ann Umamoto, is here. WCA, as I often say, small and fierce. So thank you to my staff and board. In terms of the program, um, Lynn will share more details and information on the data we're presenting in this bulletin. We'll hear from community partner Deborah Platt from the Sharing Shelf, whose on-the-ground data really allows us to tell a more accurate story. I want to thank in advance parents Laura and Leonella from our focus groups for joining us this morning to share their personal stories. As time allows, we'll take some questions at the end of the formal presentation, but encourage all of you to stay, if you can, for a coffee and additional conversation with us. Finally, last but not least, I thank Ann Bradner, Dan, and the staff of the Carver Center for being really great community partners, lending us this space, and putting up with many logistical <laughs> changes. <laughs> But here we are, and so a big thank you again for all of you for joining us. And at this time, I'll turn the podium over to Anne to welcome. Thank you. I am so delighted to see you all here today. Thank you very much for coming. I am Ann Bradner. I'm the CEO of the Port Chester Carver Center. This is my colleague, Daniel Bonet, who is our chief program officer. I see a lot of old friends in the room, but I see a whole lot of newcomers too. So I'd like to just take a quick minute and let you know a little bit about Carver Center. Um, we are a community center, and we're devoted to helping our community become nourished, educated, and empowered. We have a host of programs right now that include a large food pantry, which is downstairs in the building. We have a full-scale retail operation. We do a hot meal program for children on weekdays and for the community on Saturdays. We operate the elementary after-school program in Port Chester, and we host a teen center that helps young people develop life skills and a plan for their future after high school. Carver runs a large aquatics program. We are Port Chester's only public pool. We're host to the high school swim team. We offer citizenship classes, and just down the hall we have um, English lang language learning sessions going on with volunteers from KTI Synagogue in Rybrook. And this year, we added case management to our services so that we can help members of the community with information, referrals, and supports that increase health and wellness and expand opportunity. We're delighted to host the Westchester Children's Association today and the release of their 2023 Child by the Numbers data bulletin. Um, organizations like Carver Center use the Westchester Children's Association data to help us do our work. And um, data has become really essential. In late January, we'll be hosting a launch of our new strategic plan, and we commissioned a needs assessment particular to um, the Port Chester constituency. And I look forward to seeing how these um, studies interact and what it means about what our community needs from us. So thank you for being here. If anybody wants more information about Carver After, we're happy to um, converse or show people around you know, the building a bit. And um, thank you. Thank you. Hello there. Um, for those who don't know, I am Limerie Cabrera, and I am the Director of Data Operations and Finance at Westchester Children's Association. I am proud and somewhat terrified to <laughs> announce the release of the 2023 Data Bulletin, Children by the Numbers. This publication is celebrating its ninth anniversary, and it provides a statistical portrait of Westchester children and youth. And even though I'm the sole presenter here, uh, this was very much a team project. And I would be especially remiss if I did not mention Gabriella Nerna, our program and policy associate, who did much of our quality assurance, and Tara Framer, our graphic designer. Tara and I spent so many hours on Zoom, we could probably single-handedly support the entire company. You know, she has just been um, a major partner in this endeavor, and her gimlet eye and her design sense brings this data bull into to a whole other level. So thank you, Tara. Okay. Okay. So as you know, the data bulletin showcases demographic data as well as uh, information on child welfare, mental health, digital equity, early childhood, and youth engagement. And we believe that by bringing this information to light, we also bring to light WCA's advocacy work on these issues. 
This bulletin reflects data from 41 sources, seven community partners, and multiple government agencies, including two FOIA requests and two direct appeals to New York State government agencies. Now, this isn't our first rodeo with the data bulletin, and so we often revisit the same data over and over again, uh, so data indicators such as high school graduation, poverty rate, um, to see how things are going on over time. So one advantage of this approach is that you start getting a familiarity with the data sources. So you get a sense of when things are beginning to look out of sorts. So take, for instance, Westchester County arrests for youth under age 18. When we looked at the data from the state, we recognized that there were some anomalies uh, that didn't make sense. So we had to reach out to the state and to the Yonkers Police Department, who were, I should stress, were incredibly cooperative. And they provided us with the corrections, which is reflected in this total, uh, in these total county numbers. Um, I'd like to think that every time we go through the data bulletin, uh, we get to learn something new. And this data bulletin in particular has taught us that it's not enough to take numbers at face value. And believe me, that thought is beginning to percolate through our other work as well. Other data bulletin features besides a dropped pen is this. It's, it's so difficult to determine the importance of a statistic unless you have context for it. So as much as possible, we try to provide context and narrative for much of the data that you see here. You know, icons are throughout the data bulletin uh, and they showcase salient points, whether it is highlighting a statistic that demonstrates racial disparities or an enacted or proposed solution to some of the challenges presented by the data. But I've been blapping enough about the data for so long, that's not why you're here today. I've been talking about sources and publication and all the kind of stuff. So let's get to the meat of what of the matter here. So what does that data show us? Okay. For starters, Westchester's children and young adults make up more than 30% of Westchester's population. And 22% of them, that's more than one out of five, okay, live in poverty or they're considered low income in one of the richest counties in the United States. I just want you to sit with that thought for a moment. That's not all we see. We also see evidence of shifting demographics. We compared the 2010 and the 2020 decennial censuses, and it was a pretty eye-opening experience. A 185% jump in the multiracial children. And I have to tell you that showing this graph you know, often when we, when we show it to other people, it often leads to a pretty interesting conversation about identity. But it also raises this question, just exactly how is the county preparing for the shifting demographic, this increase in children of color? One thing's for sure, the term minority as an indication of a person of color is an outdated term indeed. And yet, and yet, Race inequity is an overarching theme that runs insidiously throughout the data bulletin. Time and time again, on multiple issues such as health, digital equity, education, unemployment, we see that children and youth of color face challenges that their counterparts don't. There's so many data visualizations showing race inequity that I can't show them all in one slide. And so I can't help but think of the old adage, the more things change, the more things stay the same. This slide in particular is showing, it's breaking down the poverty rates by age and by race. And what we are seeing is that black and Hispanic children are continuing to experience poverty at a higher rate than the rest of their peers. This is a story that is told time and time again, ever since I became director of data in 2007. And it is a story that has been told long before that. 160 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, 69 years after the segregation of public schools were declared unconstitutional by Brown versus Topeka Board of Education in the US Supreme Court case, we are still, we are still telling that same story of inequity. There's another thing that's not quite obvious when you first look at this slide, but it's very obvious when you become a you know, data nerd like me. Um, when you get into the world of data collections, when it comes to getting current up-to-date data, the struggle is real, my friends. I can tell you on Sunday, 
November 26 at 12.32 p.m. while I was working on this presentation, Kim Kardashian's latest great Instagram post, which was posted around 2 a.m. that morning, got 580,182 likes. This slide shows poverty rates from the year 2021 from the U.S. Census Bureau, five-year averages if you want to get technical about it, the 2022 poverty rates are being released next month in December, just in time for the end of 2023. And so this is a theme that unfortunately repeats itself over and over in the data bulletin. In many cases, the most current data we can collect is for 2021, which was two years ago. And just based on inflation rates alone, I can tell you that this if you took a look a little, I know it's a little small, this apparent slight two-year dip in overall poverty rates doesn't reflect the economic struggles of today. So it is unnerving to recognize that we do not have an infrastructure that collects data that, you know, on, on a more regular basis uh, to get more timely, reliable data. It is unnerving to think that we live in a society that prioritizes Instagram likes over poverty rates. But just sitting with this feeling is just like, uh, it's such a tepid response. And here at WCA, we just don't sit. So we started asking, what would happen if we reached out to our trusted community partners? They're the ones that are closest to the ground. They're the ones who are telling us what's happening to families right now. Could they give us data that's more current and that reflects on what's going on? And so. At WCA, we're always talking about how integral community partnerships are at our work. So why wouldn't it apply for our data work as well? So we reached out to multiple community partners and we said, we're seeing this dip in poverty rates. Is that what you're seeing on the ground? And the answer usually was no. So they replied with their own data. We've got data for 2022. We've got data for April 2023, which is way ahead of the US Census Bureau. And the current data, I would argue, is a much more re accurate representation of the economic struggles today at the county. We are seeing evidence of rising costs in childcare and housing. We are seeing increasing demand for assistance. The local data tells us that since 2020, the need to support children and families and families has significantly increased. Despite what those five year, overall five-year uh, poverty estimates may indicate, economic distress has not gone down in Westchester. But we didn't just reach out to local organizations just to get numbers. We also reached out to them and asked for voices. When we were in the planning stages of the data bulletin, it was important for us to figure out some way of incorporating the voices and the opinions of those that we advocate for, the children and youth of Westchester County. So the data bulletin is not just a place where numbers are shown, but it's a place where our youngest residents can be heard and seen. We wanted to say to Westchester's youth, what you say counts, what you say matters deeply. So students at one of our advocacy classes, WC offers advocacy classes, which took place at the White Plains Youth Bureau, lent their voices and told them what advocacy meant to them. And I certainly hope that it's the beginning of something more significant as we work on the next edition of the data bulletin. So the takeaways, the conclusion, what do, what do we take from this? I think. As you go through the data bulletin, you will see that race inequity is still here. We need a data, second, we need a data infrastructure that can give us a more current, accurate picture of what's going on with today's children. Local data can be the beginning of that infrastructure and stories and narrative matter. They don't compete with data, they complement it. We reached out to local partners because we were hearing the stories on the ground and then they gave us the data. They don't have to definitely, they're not in competition. Here's another one that's not on the slide and it's a proposal and a question all rolled into one. The act of counting is an act of listening and compassion. The act of counting tells people that they are being counted and that they matter and their lives deserve attention. And if we cannot count, what else is slipping through our fingers? So let's make sure our children count. One of our local community partners uh, from the Sharing Shelf, Deborah Blatt, they were kind enough to give us their data, so. Um, I wanna thank Westchester Children's Association and the Carver Center. We rely on that data. 
Um, it's really interesting because I now have a different perspective as to what my data means to you because I'm a little bit afraid about what you're about to hear from me as to what the future um, pretend, you know, what, what, what's ahead in terms of poverty. So the, for those of you who don't know, the Sharon Shelf is Westchester County's clothing bank for children, founded in 2009. We address clothing insecurity and meet basic material needs, such as new socks, underwear, diapers, hygiene products, and period products. And we do so by supporting nonprofits, schools, community organizations, who all place requests with us on behalf of their clients and their students. What is clothing insecurity? It is the lack of access to sufficient, clean, quality, age, and season appropriate clothing. Clothing insecurity impacts a child's self-esteem. It affects their attendance in school and their ability to participate in the rights of childhood, such as playing on a team because a child doesn't have sneakers, which is something that came to our attention in particular last year with the Carver Center here, which is amazing that all connects. We are all connected. Um, so they can't, so what, what is it? It means that if a child doesn't have a pair of sneakers, they can't play on a team. They don't attend a summer camp because they don't have enough clothing for one week or participate in a school concert because they don't have dress clothes or the appropriate shoes. Studies show that a child is more likely to attend school when they have access uh, to clean clothing. So the corollary is also true that a child is more likely to miss school because they don't have clean clothing. When children miss school, they fall behind. And by high school, those children are more likely to drop out with lifelong economic, social, emotional, and health consequences. When we address clothing insecurity, we recognize the dignity of children and teens and boost their self-esteem by providing them with clean age, style, and seasonal appropriate clothing. We literally cannot walk out the door without clean clothing, without clothing on. And our clothing sends a message to one another when we wear it. So the Sharing Shelf has three core programs, which is our clothing bank, our teen boutique program, which is a series of free shopping days for low-income teens held in partnership with community organizations. This fall, we expand this to offer Westchester's first free store for teens, um, teen boutique in real life. And finally, we have a backpacks to school program, which provides free backpacks filled with age and grade appropriate school supplies. This year, we benefited more than 1,900 children countywide. So that's up from 1,650 the year before. So going to what, what, is, what we're looking for, what the future portends. Uh, we are an eco-friendly approach to clothing. Uh, we, donate clo uh, we collect donations of new and gently used clothing for infants, children, and teens. We sort that clothing by size, season, and gender. And then nonprofits, as I said earlier, place requests and we assemble a wardrobe pack, which is a week's worth of seasonally appropriate clothing matched to that child's sizing needs. So as for the numbers, it's on the clothing insecurity in Westchester County is on the rise. In the last few, three years, we have seen an exponential growth in demand for our work. And I'm sad to announce that this morning at my staff meeting, which preceded this, we had to make the difficult decision to cut off any future requests for winter clothing. Um, we provide clothing, uh, we provided clothing in 2021 to just over 3,200 children. By the end of last year, we distributed 4,365 wardrobe packs. And as I mentioned, our second program is Teen Boutique, so that does not take that into consideration. Combined with Teen Boutique, we served over 5,000 children and teens last year. Um, when I looked at my numbers last night, <laughs> um, we had received 5,150 requests for wardrobe packs this year to date. We're not even in December. In the past four weeks alone, we've received over 700 requests for clothing. That's an increase, and I probably don't have my numbers, right, of more than 40% since last year, in one year. Um, it's a problem facing children countywide, and no community is immune. While our numbers show, and again, I wanna thank Lynn Marie because we started to track by community and by race with her support. Um, our numbers show that most children are coming from communities with high levels of poverty. Yonkers and Port Chester lead the way, and I believe Port Chester is in part because of our location is here in Port Chester. But we have also provided clothing to children in the wealthiest suburbs of Westchester, including Rye, Scarsdale, Irvington, and Chappaqua. I'm often asked, why are these numbers going up? New arrivals, who are these children? Why, why are they increasing so rapidly? 56%, again, our numbers are mirroring what, what the Westchester Children's Association is seeing in terms of racial disparities. 56% of the children we served identified as Hispanic or Latino. 21% identified as black or African American. Less than 2% of the children we served identified as white or Caucasian. 
these numbers cannot be explained simply because we have new arrivals. I would love to say it's because people have come to know and trust the sharing shelf. We've been doing this for 14 years. But the reality is part of the broader picture that the Westchester Children's Association and Marie are presenting to you today. Families at the bottom end of the economic ladder have become so pinched financially that they are struggling to provide clothing for their children. That's their new reality. So hopefully that, thank you for your time. We not only talk to organizations, but we uh, talk to parents and families and children. So we want to cede the floor to two of our parents today, Laura Hernandez and Leonela Mosquera. And um, I am handing the floor over to you. <laughs> Thank you. This is my personal story, a story on my son and Medicaid. Starting in April 23, Medicaid paid directly for the medication. Access to medicine is now a big problem. Medication that my son usually use are now the need. In case the omeprazole liquid, but my son no eat nothing for the mouth, I need G2, is very expensive for me. This time they took three months for the approval. This nebulizer that need be replaced is what they need for me, no more. The saline water they require for the nebulizer, I need a special authorization for the approval. Sometimes the doctors help in the process to get the medication approved, but sometimes they said, I am sorry, I cannot. My son is disabled, has Down syndrome and multiple disabilities. It's very difficult to lie with the stress, the stress of who the get extra money for pay for medication. He's is the night. Thinking that the next month I might not have the money to pay for this medication worries me because from April today, the list of medication that my son medicates does not cover is increased. When I look for a specialist, MVP customer service, my insurance, give me up to 10 options in my area. But when I call for the schedule and appointment, the answer is they not receive MVP, Medicaid. I don't understand who they have the list, the doctors who don't know accepting MVP, Medicaid. It is, it is sad, very sad, because the people I need help and the workers in the government institution who are not resolved the situation like this. The people is a very rude, very cranky. They never had answer. No full staff, no full staff. They excuse all time. The, in the government institution, the list for way attention is very long. The tram, regular tram take two months, three months, lost the paper, I forgot this, not received the, the letter. Excuse, excuse, excuse. The workers, the programs of the Medicaid, I don't know, I forgot working with the people. I need help. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Lianella Mosquera. I had two kids. Uh, I got a bad experience with the food stamp. Um, food stamp, um, I, they say I don't qualify because I make too much money, and that's for because I'm a single man. And just because um, I get child support, they say I, it has an extra income. So they take away my food stamp, my Medicaid. So it's like almost four months and call and apply, and they say, oh, you got to take you make too much money, always excuse. And I don't know what to do. Um, and I don't have a, now I have Medicaid because I have, uh, I have two boys. So the little one have um, autism, autism. So that's the reason they give me back my Medicaid. But my, my first boy doesn't have it. So I say, what I have to do? And they say, yes, yes, take the father of your son for, for child support. 
so you can get less money. And I say, how are I gonna do it? How am I gonna go survive? Because in a single month, I have to pay rent, my car, insurance, a lot of things, and they don't understand. So the thing is, my mother, friends help me, so I go to the shore, get food, but my, my little boy is so uh, picky eating because he doesn't eat e everything. So I gotta buy from my, from my money, I don't make too much money, uh, weekly. So that's, that's my experience, I'm so mad, I don't know what to do about this situation. And I already applied three months and I'm still waiting. I called last week and they told me to wait 30 more days. I say, why I have to wait 30 more days? And they say, we're gonna see if you qualify. You wanna, you have to bring more proof. I said, more proof or what? And they said, your income is too much. I don't know. And the Medicaid, I got the Medicaid, but still I gotta pay for, for the medicine. My son was yesterday in the hospital because he got a, a, a bad rash. So I gotta pay $20 for, for his medicine. I don't know why. I got a call. So that's my experience with this. Um, with the Medicaid first time, they don't care about, really they don't care about the, me when I go. I don't like to go in person because they look at me like I ask them for a favor and I, I ask for my kids, for the right for my kids, but they don't care. Just say, oh, just apply, call, call this number and I'm be in the line for an hour or more and if they don't help. They don't do anything. And in the school, I got, I don't have lunch anymore, lunch free. I, now I have a lunch, but before they say I don't qualify because just for the child support money. I don't receive that money. They only, I don't receive that money. So he does, the, the father of my son doesn't give me that money. So that's only when he working. But it still is an account. They, how say, they account that money in my income. So I made over money, so. And so, so sad, mad because of that. Almost four months I don't receive full stamp. So I, I like, you guys can help her, put like good employers, help her people, you know, for like single, it's a lot of single mothers like me, you know. I only make 500 um, a week, that's not too much. When I go to Sons, I gotta spend 300, 400 in grocery, diapers, because my son is still have just diapers, all the stuff. Sometimes I don't have it. I don't, I don't have enough money, that's why my friends, my mom, this guy, my mom helped me a lot. But I say that's not supposed to be. The government supposed to help my kids, you know, not to me, to my kids. But they don't do it. They don't do it. They say they do it, but they don't do it anything. Sometimes they don't want to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much for really sharing your personal story and definitely want to connect you to friend and colleague Dan on your way out that perhaps if you're here in the Port Chester area can offer some immediate support to you. But you know the, short, the stories that you shared are not unique to you. Unfortunately, we have heard these things over and over again. And some of the advocacy that WCA is involved with at the state level with state partners to really reduce child poverty has to do with improving the Medicaid system, um, access to things like food stamps, making universal school meals available to all. There's no reason that every child in this country should not have a school meal regardless of income or background. So I'm going to share some more details on our advocacy, but since we have Legislative Bar, I just wanted to know if you wanted to, to say a few words on behalf of your uh, colleagues. We welcome that, and then I will close this out. Thank you. I didn't know I was going to say anything today, but I'm always, um, I'm of course, very happy to. Um, you know, we, this is the time of year when we are working on the, the budget for the county, and that's mostly something that the executive branch does, and then we sort of, you know, get to look it over and give our two cents for what it's worth. And then we have some amount of money that we can sort of, you know, disperse within a lot of different, um, a lot of different parameters and restrictions. And so we do try to be in touch with our not-for-profit partners and friends to see how we can 
help if we can help. And this year, um, and we don't, we don't get a lot of information about how much money we can work with until really the very last minute. So for example, we did not have that information as of last night. And we need to, on Monday, that is our, our, our deadline, uh, by, by law, that is our deadline for adding anything that we're going to try to add to the, uh, to the budget for next year. So um, if you feel like people are being, you know, not responsive to you, we don't have the full information yet. But what we do have is an incredible amount of respect for all of the people in this room, all of the work that you do. Many of us are, you know, regularly in touch with, with you. We, 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 we look to you for our, um, you know, for statistics, for data, for what your particular needs are. We, we work um, with our um, executive director of our um, youth bureau, who, who is here today, Dr. Harris Madden. And, and so that's, that's the good news. I can say that, you know, the majority of us on the board are, are very committed to our community-based organizations, and, um, and that is and that is why you know I'm here today, and there are other representatives from the board um, here today, but since they, their uh, legislators couldn't be here. Um, so I, I think you know you should always feel free to reach out to us. We you know we have an open door policy. We're very interested in hearing from you, and if you haven't heard from us, feel free to just you know bug us and nudge us, um, because I think. You know, as somebody once said, we are so much stronger together. We know that the for-profit world does a lot of networking. They, they, you know, do a lot of deals sort of, you know, uh, you know, at their networking events. They know somebody, so they, you know, offer somebody a job. We need to do the same thing, and I think we do, and I think you do in the not-for-profit world, but we need to leverage it as much as we can because there's so many people uh, here in this room and beyond who really, really care about everyone in Westchester, no matter their income, their race, their religion, their beliefs. We all, we believe that everybody deserves basics to live a decent life with dignity. So thank you so much for, for putting this together and for bringing people together. And I'm looking forward to working more with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we would all agree that what we've heard this morning truly underscores the urgency for systemic change to address racial inequities and improve outcomes for all children in our county. Local data, has been pivotal in understanding real-time situations and in advocating for effective interventions and policy changes to uplift the well-being and opportunities of all children and youth in Westchester County. As I said, we have the bulletin available on your way out, but I want to draw your attention, let me mention this new area that we've added um, about advocacy and action in our report. And I beg you really to join WCA's advocacy's efforts to prevent child homelessness, reduce child poverty, support the mental health needs of our students, cut health inequities, improve digital access, and broaden youth justice opportunities. From advocating to expand funds to the County Youth Bureau for out-of-school mental health supports, to improving the New York State Child Tax Credit, to school meals for alls, to solutions and not suspensions for our students. The policy details are in this bulletin and on WCA's website, and I ask you to join us. In light of the insights from the bulletin, WCA is calling for these comprehensive efforts to take systemic imbalances to tackle, sorry, and systemic imbalances, dismantle barriers, and create inclusive environments. Advocating for equitable programs and policies is crucial in fostering environments where every child and youth can thrive. 
and WCA is committed to being at the forefront of these advocacy efforts, and we thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you.